Welcome to the Peace Haven Weekly Podcast. Weekly message audio from Peace Haven Baptist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We continue our study in Daniel, with this sermon entitled, The Ram and Goat. We thank you for listening and be sure to visit us at www.findpeace.today. Continue in Daniel this morning. And last week we uh, saw Daniel's first vision of these four terrifying beasts. And I, I'm, I had some questions, and, and we've gone over this a little bit, but just so you don't get confused, uh, I made a timeline uh, of Daniel. Uh, so the first six chapters that we've looked at, we, we said those are historical narrative, and so those are... Um, the accounts of what happened to Daniel and his friends. And those are, uh, they're in chronological order. So we, we started the first four chapters with Nebuchadnezzar and then the uh, next king of Babylon. We skipped some kings of Babylon here. Uh, then chapter 5 uh, is during the reign of Belshazzar. And if you will recall, he was a co-regent um, under his uh, father. And then we moved... Uh, to Daniel chapter 6 in the, the first year of Darius. And then that mentions Daniel even served under uh, Cyrus. And then Daniel chapter 7 through 12, the rest of the book, um, those aren't historical narratives, but these are the dreams and the visions that Daniel has. And so last week we begin in, in chapter 7, and then this week we will look at chapter 8, and those both happen during the reign of Belshazzar. And so it kind of flashes back, and then those visions, uh, they're in chrono- chronological order, but they kind of overlap uh, in the middle. And so there is a uh, timeline so you can see uh, kind of what we'll be looking at. And so da- Daniel chapter 7, last week we looked at the vision of those four beasts. Uh, this week we will see the vision of uh, a ram and a goat. And then chapter 9 is Daniel's vision of 70 weeks. Uh, then chapters 10 through 11, uh, you'll see I have those circled. Those are actually grouped together. Um, this is one vision that Daniel has, and he sees uh, an immense lengthy battle uh, between the kings of the north and the, and the south. And we'll, we'll look at that in, in Daniel chapter 11. Uh, and it's a lot like today. Um, today, and, and especially Daniel chapter 11, will seem like there's a lot of, of history um, Daniel records this vision uh, that we're looking at today around 550 B.C. Uh, during, the, the again, the, the reign of Belshazzar. Uh, and it pertains to events that will happen uh, over 200 years later. Um, what Daniel sees and learns happens long after his death. He, he's not on the scene anymore. Uh, he's looking at things that happened years, uh, centuries in the future. And this is why many critics of the Bible say that, that Daniel was written much later. Um, no one, they say, could possibly uh, predict this accurately, uh, what happens in, in the future with this much precision. Um, and if you want to be reminded of uh, the evidence for an early date rather than a late date, um, you can go back to our introductory uh, sermon in the series that we did, we, we talked about some of those evidences, um, but the critics in part are, are correct. Uh, no one can predict with this accuracy, uh, but Daniel actually doesn't predict anything, uh, and that's what's funny. Instead, what, what he does is record what is revealed to him by God. That is an important distinction. Uh, this is how all biblical prophecy worked. Uh, biblical prophecy is not people looking into a crystal ball and, and predicting the future. Uh, biblical prophecy is uh, men and women who were moved by the Spirit of God, who had direct revelation from God uh, as God tells them what He is orchestrating uh, for the future, what the future will hold and how events will unfold. And, and that's really the whole point uh, that we've seen over and over in, in Daniel is Daniel is about this God that sets up and deposes kings. Uh, this God that is sovereign, uh, who declares the end from the beginning. And so, uh, hopefully you've, you've heard this before, but if not, this is 
uh, uh, kind of one of those slogans or cliches that has a lot of meaning. All of history is His story. When we look at history, it's, it's all God's story of redemption. Uh, Isaiah 46, 8 through 11 says, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of counsel comes from a far country. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. And so as believers, uh, we rest in the truth that, that God will accomplish His plan, His will. That He is the one that declares, uh, as this says, from ancient, thing, from ancient times, things not yet done. And, and that's prophecy. God declaring from old things that will happen. Uh, And then what God purposes, He will accomplish. And so uh, today for the kids, uh, our word of the day is going to be horn or horns. And so as we go through this, listen and and pay attention to what two animals Daniel sees in his vision. uh, What is special about the horns of these two animals. And then think about what these uh, to these horns that we are hearing about, or will hear, hear about, uh, what those horns represent. And so I'm going to read the entirety uh, of this chapter, and then we'll, we'll dig into it. So Daniel, uh, we, we find, it says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision... And when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ula Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him. And there was none who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. The goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram. And he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown." And host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For 2300 evenings and mornings, Then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near to where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. 
But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation. For it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from this nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not only by his power, and he shall cause fearful destruction, and shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many. He shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I arose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. <clears throat> and so this is Daniel's second vision. Again, during the, the reign of Belshazzar. So he's under uh, the Babylonian king. This happens when he's in Babylon. And in it, he is transported in this vision, in this dream, he is transported to the city of Susa. Uh, if you have the, the King James Version, it will say Sushan. Uh, Susa was the, here you can see Babylon, and then here's Susa. Uh, Susa was the winter capital, or became the winter winter capital of the, the Medo-Persians. Uh, it's 250 miles east of Babylon, and if you read the books, uh, uh, read the book of Esther, uh, Susa is where the events of Esther take place. And so as Daniel stands on the banks of the Ula Canal, he sees uh, a ram in his vision. And the ram has two horns, but one horn, here you can see on this picture, hopefully this horn is longer or higher uh, than the other. And this ram charges west and north and south, and, and no one can stop him. And in verse 20, we are, we're told, we don't have to guess, we don't have to wonder uh, who this ram represents. We're told that the ram represents the Medo-Persian Empire. And so the one horn uh, being smaller would be uh, representative of, of the Median Empire that, that wasn't as strong and powerful as the Persians uh, that kind of absorbed that empire. Uh, and they did conquest to the west. Uh, they had uh, conquered the Babylonians. They conquered Syria and Asia Minor. Uh, they charged to the north, conquering Armenia and the Caspian Sea. Uh, they also conquered much of the territory to the south in Egypt and Ethiopia. Uh, the Medo-Persians conquered the known world uh, in a bit less than 30 years. Uh, and in uh, the Zodiac, uh, they fell under the sign of Ares, the ram, uh, when their military marched across the, the world as they were fighting battles. Uh, their military wore the insignia uh, or the emblem of a ram, and they carried a gold ram's head when they marched into battle. Uh, they were powerful. They were the dominant empire for almost 200 years after the Babylonians. Um, that is, until they poked a hornet's nest. Uh, which was Greece. Um, both Darius and Xerxes, uh, both of them were Persian kings, and they both tried to invade Greece in 490 and 480 B.C. Uh, and in both instances, uh, the Persians were defeated, and they returned home with their tail between their legs. Uh, but that caused, their, their two attempts caused a, a great hatred in Greece for the Persians. Uh, and so they viewed the, the Persians as barbarians, as, as savages, as uneducated and uh, inferior 
to themselves. Uh, the Greek view themselves as uh, the most superior and refined people in all the world at the time because their, their culture had produced uh, Socrates, uh, Plato, and Aristotle. And, and actually, Aristotle uh, would become the teacher or tutor of a young boy named Alexander the Great uh, that would grow up and become the, the king and leader of, of Greece. And so in Daniel's vision, uh, he sees this great horn on a goat uh, that stands opposite uh, of the ram. Uh, and this great horn is Alexander. The goat comes from the west uh, across the whole earth and his feet never seem to touch the ground. And so Alexander's armies uh, conquered the Persians and the, and the known world with incredible speed. Uh, the goat charges the rams and, and breaks off its horns, uh, it crushes the Persians, uh, tramples them to the ground. Uh, and so in only around four years, uh, Alexander conquers and, and takes over all of this. Um, wow. I mean, can you imagine in, in four years taking that much of, of the world and having that under your control? Um, he conquered all of Persia. Uh, and it's really interesting, Alexander did come to uh, Jerusalem, uh, but he left every city that he went to, he, he destroyed it, but he left Jerusalem uh, intact. And when you read the record of, of Josephus, Josephus says the reason that he left Jerusalem intact is because as Alexander was approaching the city, some of the priests heard that he was coming and they said, okay, let's pray about this. Let's think about this. Let's devise a plan. And so one of the priests said, I've got an idea. Uh, let's all dress up in our, our priestly garb and we'll meet Alexander before he gets the sit to the city and we'll take him this and let him read it. And guess what it was they took and let him read? Daniel. And Alexander, they showed him the prophecy of uh, this goat being Greece and the great horn being the first king. And Alexander saw that and recognized, hey, that's me. That's really cool that they they know about me before I got here, so I'm going to leave them alone. And so that that's why Alexander left. He was pleased with the prophecy, and so he left Jerusalem intact. Um, and so Alexander conquers all of this territory. He is uh, This is the greatest uh, empire, uh, the greatest empire that the world has seen. Um, and then he, he dies suddenly. Uh, he became king when he was 20 years old, uh, after his father Philip was assassinated. Um, and he is king for 10 years, and, and he dies certain, suddenly at, at 30 years old. And he has no heir. Um, and so his empire is divided among his four generals. Uh, this great horn is uh, broken off. And four more horns rise in its place. And so these are the four kingdoms that will rise from that one nation. Uh, Alexander had four generals that divided up his kingdom. And so you have uh, Ptolemy, uh, the Seleucids, Lysimachus, and Cassander. And so uh, the, two, the two that became the most dominant are the first two, the, the Ptolemies and, and the Seleucids. And we'll focus more on them in, in chapter 11. Uh, chapter 11 gets into a lot of details uh, about this almost soap opera kind of epic uh, between the, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And so then from, from one of those four horns that Daniel sees, um, those four kingdoms, a, a little horn begins to grow out of one of them, and, and, and that is the, the Seleucids. Uh, this little horn, its actions uh, are the focus of Daniel chapter 8. The horn doesn't stay small. It begins to grow and it grows up towards the heavens. It becomes uh, a great and strong, powerful horn. Uh, it, it grows to the south, the east, and to the glorious land. And, and when we see the glorious land, uh, Daniel is, is talking about Israel the, and Palestine. Uh, that area is, is the glorious land. And so what Daniel sees next is disturbing. Uh, this horn, it grows even to the, the host of heaven. Uh, and it, it, it casts stars to the ground. And we'll talk about what that means. Uh, it becomes as great as the prince of hosts. It takes away the burnt offerings and overthrows uh, the sanctuary. 
It said that it will tr- throw truth to the ground and it will prosper. And so here is this horn that is, is doing uh, wicked, evil things, these great atrocities. And Daniel's told it, it's going to prosper. It's going to succeed in, in committing these heinous and, and evil acts. And we see how serious this is and, and what it means. Verse 20, 23, uh, we are told this king will be uh, arrogant and prideful and, and he'll be a, a capable enemy. Um, nothing going over his head. He, he is a, a capable adversary and that his name will bring fear and wherever he goes he will bring destruction and for a time he will be successful in all that he does and, and what he does is kill and destroy. He kills without prejudice. He kills the warrior. He kills the priest. He kills the saints. And so when it talks about him casting stars down from the heavens and, and the host of heavens, that is how the Bible talks about the people of God. Um, how it talks about God's people as being like the stars, being like the host. Uh, and, and so this king will go in and he's going to, to persecute and kill uh, and destroy the saints. He's cunning. He's deceitful. He's manipulative and wicked. And in his own mind, he is great. In his own mind, he is God. And without warning, Daniel is told he will destroy many. And so the king that fits this description to a T in history is Antiochus IV. Antiochus came to power in 175 B.C. And he names himself uh, Theos Antiochus Epiphanes, the illustrious god Antiochus. He claims that he was Zeus incarnate. He mints coins that bear his image and his title uh, on the coin and requires all the people uh, under his jurisdiction and power uh, to use those coins as currency. Uh, but many of his subjects, rather than calling him uh, Antiochus Epiphanes called him Antiochus Epimenes, uh, and that means the madman. Uh, he he was he was crazy. Uh, he was prideful and arrogant, and had a, a a high view of himself. And a lot of what we know about Antiochus uh, not only comes from uh, secular kind of history, uh, but also from the books of First and Second Maccabees, which which aren't in our Bible. Uh, they are in some versions of, of Bible. We call those the Apocrypha. Um, we, we don't say that those are uh, inspired by God, but they do contain some good, uh, often historical information. Um, and so in 168 B.C., uh, after a failed campaign against uh, the Ptolemies in Egypt, uh, Antiochus storms back into Jerusalem. Remember, Egypt is kind of south of, of Jerusalem. And so he storms back to Jerusalem uh, after his loss, and he has his soldiers kill 40,000 people in the span of, of three days. And another 40,000 are captured and sold into slavery. Uh, it's estimated that he kills over 100,000 uh, Jewish men, women, and children. Uh, he enters into the temple he sets up an altar of Zeus and sacrifices a pig on the altar. And, and you know that uh, in Leviticus, when we looked at those purity laws and the animals that were clean and unclean, that a, a pig was unclean. And so here you have this king going into God's temple and sacrificing a pig. And after he sacrifices the pig, he, he makes the priest uh, eat the flesh of the pig, and he sprinkles the blood of the pig all around the altar and the sanctuary. He makes the Jewish people follow suit and, and makes laws that make them uh, sacrifice pigs or, or face death. He makes circumcision illegal and punishable by death. He stops the regular sacrifices that were offered each morning and evening at the temple. He stops the feast and the uh, special holidays of celebration uh, that the Jewish people observed. He, he burns any copy of the Tanakh that he finds. And if you're found with a copy of God's law, uh, he had you killed on sight. And so this was Antiochus the, the fourth, and it fits this description of this king that we find in Daniel. 
And so when we look at this, what, what do we do with a text like this? How, how do we begin to, to find application? Because this is a, a lot of information. It's a lot of descriptive kind of text. And so today we have to, uh, we've, we've condensed it down into really an ancient world history lesson. And if you want to know more uh, about Alexander or the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, um, Antiochus, you can actually go home and look them up on Google, on your, on your computer. Uh, you, you can look up and find more information uh, about these people, uh, this nation, these kings, um, these wars, these battles that were fought. Um, and that in itself, guys, should at least be part of our application to, to recognize that this is a prophetic revelation that, beca- that became verifiable history. That, that it, let that sink in. That's amazing that this is prophetic revelation given to Daniel that becomes verifiable history. This, this is evidence, guys, for an all-knowing God that exists. This, this is evidence of a God not only that exists, but a God that has revealed Himself to us, that reveals truth to us. This is evidence of the accuracy and reliability of, of God's Word. And, and so I hope that is encouraging to you as it encourages me um, that we can believe God's Word, that we can trust it, that we have evidence and proof that it is reliable, that it's authentic, that it's trustworthy. Uh, and that brings us to a, a second application, that, that God's Word is an anchor for our hope. And so God reveals to Daniel how bad things are going to get. Um, as I looked at this this week, I thought, man, what, what do you do with this? Because it, it really just ends with a, a punch in the gut of this is what's going to happen. It's going to be bad. It, it's going to be horrible, Daniel. And, and Daniel's sick. He, he's got anxiety uh, about this. He, he lays in his bed for days after seeing this. It's It's devastating. But there is a silver lining. This king, this anti-God figure doesn't win. And we have to focus on that and remember that. God is is telling Daniel what will happen at the time of the end. And so when we see that, um, if you're like a lot of people, our our mind wants to go, okay, this is talking about the end of, of time. Um, but he doesn't say the end of time. He says the time of, of the end. Don't jump to conclusions that this is about the end of time. It, it's about, God says, the end of indignation. The end of this king that is going to be this uh, tyrannical, evil uh, maniac that is going to, to persecute God's people. It's the end of the Greek empire and the tyrant Antiochus IV. When one of the figures asks, How long is this going to last? It reminds me of Psalm 13. It's got this feeling of, How long, O Lord? How long will you forget me? Are you you just going to abandon us? Are are you letting this temple be desecrated and destroyed because you've forgotten us? Because you're, you're done with us? Because you're abandoning us? And this figure is told it will be for 2,300 evenings and mornings. And after that, the sanctuary will be restored to its rightful state. There is some debate uh, over what those 2,300 evenings and mornings represent or what they mean. Um, Does it mean 2,300 days, uh, which is, is just short of seven years? Or does it mean... Half that amount of time. Uh, Because the the way it's stated is um, 2,300 evening and mornings. And we're talking about the sanctuary. And what do they do at the sanctuary? They offer morning and evening (coughs) sacrifices. And so is it talking about 2,300 sacrifices, which would be uh, only uh, 1,500 days or so? And so does, does it mean these are 2,300 days just short of seven years, or does it mean half that since it's talking about 
evening and, and morning sacrifices. And, and so people kind of debate about that. Um, but the interesting thing uh, is it, it really doesn't matter because both dates work. Uh, and this is really fascinating. Um, if we said that God is talking about almost seven years here, uh, Antiochus began persecuting Israel in 170 B.C. And he does so until the temple is restored in 164 B.C. And so his persecution of the Jewish people, his persecution in Jerusalem lasts just short of seven years. But what if we say it is half that? What if we say it's 1,150 days? So now we're looking at around three and a half years, just short of three and a half years. Well, the temple was desecrated near the end of 168 B.C. And Antiochus is, is driven out and the temple is cleansed in, in 164 B.C. And so this is when and this is why the Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah. Uh, and Hanukkah is, is mentioned in our Bibles. It's uh, In the New Testament is the Feast of Dedication and, and Jesus did attend this. And it's a celebration of them driving out uh, Antiochus and, and cleansing the temple after it had been desecrated. And so uh, for roughly three and a half years, the temple will, will lay desecrated until it is cleansed again. So it doesn't matter which way you look at those dates, they, they both can play out and, and, and kind of link up to what's going on around the time of Antiochus IV. And Daniel is, is shown some disturbing things. He's shown that um, God's people are going to be persecuted and killed. He's shown that God's temple would be desecrated. And you have to pause there and, and, and say something that you might not have, it might not have popped in your brain. It didn't in mine for a little bit. Um, but where's the temple right now when Daniel is, is seeing this? It's been destroyed already, right? It, it was destroyed under Nebuchadnezzar. And so if he's hearing about it being desecrated, what does that tell Daniel? It's going to be rebuilt. And so this shows Daniel, even, even in this, there's a little bit of hope because Daniel sees, well, well Jeremiah talks about us going back and, and God's temple going to be rebuilt. And, and so even though I know this bad thing is happening, God's going to be faithful to that promise. And so if God's faithful to that, then maybe I can trust Him with this. If I can trust Him with this, then maybe I can trust Him with this over here. And guys, that's how our life works a lot of times. Is God shows us, listen, if you'll let go and you'll trust me in this little thing here, then maybe you can trust me with some bigger things over here. Now remember, remember I was faithful in that. Trust me, keep, keep trusting me. Keep walking with me. Think back over your life. H have I let you down? Think back. Haven't I always been there? You, you can trust me with, with what's coming. I, I know it's bad, but you can trust me. And so Daniel is, is shown that the temple will be rebuilt. And God would have the last word. This king would be broken, it says, but by no human hand. And, and there's two things here. I, I should have talked about this earlier, but um, we're, we're looking at this little horn that, that comes from these four horns on the goat, right? And, and so where have we already seen a, a little horn? We saw a little horn last week in Daniel chapter 7 that was on the fourth beast, okay? And so th there's some different interpretation kind of issues and, and people land on that in different ways too. A lot of people would say, well, Daniel chapter 7 is about the, the end time Antichrist. And so you have to kind of decide, is, is Daniel talking about years down the future or is he, is, is he talking about Antiochus? And, and so this horn on the, the ram matches this fourth beast and, and that fourth beast is Antiochus or are we to look for something way ahead years in the future? Or, or could it be both? And so there's some of that that you, you have to, to think about and, and kind of consider and, and come to terms in, in your own mind. I'm not telling you uh, the answer, okay? I, I know my opinion, form your own from, from God's Word. Um, but Daniel is, is shown this destruction of, of this little king, uh, this little horn. But this king is broken by no human hand, and, and we've heard that before too, right? Daniel chapter 2. 
And he says when, when these four kingdoms are established that the stone is going to come that is cut out by no human hand. And, and so, again, there's parallels, and, and it's up to you to figure out, okay, is, does this all go together, or are we talking about something over here? And, and so those are exercises that we have to do as we come across and, and think about and think through theology and especially uh, eschatology. Um, but, but this king would be broken by no human hand. And, and what happens with Antiochus is he dies suddenly. Uh, there is the Maccabean revolt, uh, but they are not the ones that, that kill Antiochus. Antiochus dies uh, mysteriously. Uh, a lot of people think it was from some kind of uh, intestinal uh, disease that, that he had. Uh, the book of Maccabees talks about a, a sharp pain that he had in his stomach and uh, falling out of his, his wagon dead. And, and so, uh, again, nobody killed him, but God's hand mysteriously uh, takes him out. And so, again, we're showed that, that, that this king, these beasts, they come and they go, but, but God's kingdom stands. God's word stands. Finally, one th- last thing that we can apply um, is thinking about how we live on a daily basis. Um, we, we know, all of us, we're, we can be honest, we've talked, we have conversations about this, I have conversations with people about this all the time, but the world is, is not getting better. Uh, it, it's getting worse, and things are going crazy, and, and things are going off the rails. Um, we know it, it, it's getting worse. We know that Christians are facing increasing persecution around the world. Uh, We have seen the rise and fall of of kings, of leaders, uh, even in world history class. You've seen the rise and fall of leaders that have acted like Antiochus. They've hated God's people. They've oppressed. They've been uh, destructive. They've killed. We've seen examples of that through history. And so what do we do while we wait for Jesus' return? Uh, The answer to that is, is we keep going. Um, we, we keep doing our duty. We, we re- remain faithful to our calling. Uh, the last verse of this chapter says that Daniel, uh, this disturbed him and he laid sick for some days. But eventually, he puts his feet down, gets out of bed, and he goes about the king's business. He does what he's supposed to do. He goes on about his daily life. He doesn't stay in that worry and anxiety. Eventually, he comes to a place where he's content and finds comfort in the God that he knows, the God that he serves and worships. And he says, okay, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep trusting. I'm going to keep, I've already heard it once this morning, and and guys, it's the truth. One step at a time. One step at a time. Just make that next step. Just walk one step at a time with Jesus. Jesus. Eventually, he rises and goes about the king's business. And I read an illustration this week, and I'll leave you with this. Um, but John Wesley, a uh, Methodist uh, preacher, was riding to preach, and he was stopped by a stranger on his way to a, a preaching engagement. And the stranger said, um, What would you do if you knew that Jesus was coming back at noon tomorrow? And the story goes, John Wesley uh, looked in his Satchel pulled out his his diary with his uh, agenda and his things that he had scheduled for the rest of the day. And uh, he talked about what he had for the rest of the day and talked about what the plans that he had for the next day. And he said, I, I guess I would do that. And, and so the point is, he, he, he didn't say, well, I'm going to do things differently because I, I know he, that he's, his return is immediate. Guys, his, his return is imminent. We, we don't know the day. So every day we should live like it, it could be today. Every day we should, if you think back a long time ago to when we were in Ephesians and we talked about um, apocalypse, those moments of uh, apocalypse. And we often think about apocalypse as the end of the world, the end of time. But, but, but what Paul is telling us in Ephesians is we are to be those moments of apocalypse, heaven meeting earth now for our friends and neighbors. We, we should... We should be God's kingdom now as we're living because we're part of it already. We're part of it already, so we should live that out now, right? We we don't have to wait and be frustrated or or anxious or worry about 
what is coming. We, we know the end of the story. That's the main focus. And everything that happens in the middle, we may not understand it. But we know the end. We, we know where our security lies ultimately. We know where our, our hope lies ultimately. And so what, whatever happens, if we truly believe that, if we truly focus on that, then whatever comes our way, we're okay. We can weather the storm. We can weather what life brings us, what we have to walk through, because we're relying on Jesus and we know who has the ultimate victory. Next week we'll look at the uh, 70 weeks. I'm excited about that. Um, And uh, pray you guys have a good week. And uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and how encouraging it is that it's true, that it's reliable, that it's an anchor for us. God, we just thank you for for that and for what you teach us, how you encourage us and and, um, comfort us, how you give us hope and strength. Uh, to endure our daily lives. And God, just please continue to walk with us and and shape us in the knowledge of who you are so we'll have confidence and and victory. So we'll have courage to share your light with others because you are coming back. And God, we wait for that day and uh, we will celebrate when we see you coming to rule and to reign and restore. God, we love you. Thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys have a good week.